bad, it's a bad place to be when you got little kids. Cause uh, they shoot in your apartments. They could get on a, they could get, like they could go on the porch, you know, and they could get a, a scope, you know, and shoot dead into your house and kill up your whole family if they want to. Come with me and be immortal. Fans of the horror genre will probably be familiar with the classic horror movie Candyman, which debuted in 1992. Since then, Candyman has found its place in the classic horror movie Hall of Fame and has garnered so much attention that it is slated to be rebooted by none other than Jordan Peele. The premise is deceptively simple. A graduate student is investigating an urban legend in the Cabrini Green housing projects in Chicago regarding a mystical killer with a hook for a hand known as Candyman. Candyman. This killer then materializes to shed innocent blood in order to preserve his legend. Even creepier is within the context of the movie, in order to summon Candyman, one must say his name five times in a mirror, and then he will appear. But what does a fictional horror movie about a man covered in bees wielding a hook killing innocent people have to do with an unresolved murder case from the 80s? More than you would think. Our story begins in the 1980s near the near west side of Chicago, Illinois at the Abla Housing Projects. The Abla Housing Projects held about 17,000 residents, even higher than the Cabrini Green Housing Projects located in the near north side of Chicago, which is the same housing projects that Candyman is referencing in the film. The real life story, however, takes place in the Abla Housing Projects which were one of the four separate public housing developments part of the Chicago Housing Authority, or the CHA. These sets of homes soon became riddled with frequent crime and violence. The Abla development in particular was primarily controlled by the gang, the Black Gangster Disciples, a violent prison gang. The high-rise buildings themselves were mismanaged, in poor conditions, with broken elevators, unlit stairwells, and frequented by drug addicts. Murder was too common in these projects, and crime an everyday occurrence. Death frequented the halls of the Abla high-rise buildings. I'll tell you the truth, I'd be scared. Because you never know what happened in the dark. Fear is a way of life here. Fear makes the isolation of racial segregation and poverty even deeper. The vast 80 acres of space between buildings is more like an armed camp under siege than the peaceful park envisioned by the architect. Fear traps the residents high within their apartments. Fear keeps the rest of us out. Enter Ruthie McCoy, a 52-year-old woman who took residence at the Abla housing development. McCoy had a history of being somewhat unstable. She would often curse at people in the street, talked to herself in public, and had frequent episodes of paranoia in which she would claim that people were threatening her life. And many times, these claims were simply chalked up to her being delusional. But on April 22, 1987, those claims would become reality. The following is a transcript of the 911 call that took place between Ruthie McCoy and the police at around 8.45 p.m. that evening. McCoy. I'm a resident at 1440 West 13th Street, and some people next door are totally tearing this down, you know? Dispatcher. What are they doing, ma'am? They want to break in? McCoy. 
Yeah, they throw the cabinet down. Dispatcher. From where? McCoy. I'm in the projects. I'm on the other side. You can reach... can reach my bathroom. They want to come in through the bathroom. Dispatcher. All right, ma'am, what's the address? McCoy. 1440 West 13th Street, apartment 1109. The elevator's working. Dispatcher. 1109? All right. What's your name, ma'am? McCoy. Ruth McCoy. Dispatcher. All right, we'll send you the police. After the phone conversation between McCoy and the dispatcher, there was some confusion on the dispatcher's end as to what Ruthie McCoy was actually trying to report. Due to this, he did dispatch officers to McCoy's location, but didn't report the call as a break-in attempt, instead citing it as disturbance with a neighbor. This classification may have explained why, a few minutes past 9 p.m., there were still no police that had arrived at McCoy's apartment. At 9.02 p.m., a neighbor calls the police, reporting gunshots from apartment 1109. At 9.04 p.m., another neighbor calls police, also reporting gunshots. Two more police cars were dispatched to the apartment. Around 9.10 p.m., the police finally arrive at the Abla housing development. They knock on the door multiple times, but there is no response from anyone inside. They then attempt to call McCoy's phone. Police officers on scene report hearing the phone ring from inside the apartment over and over with no response. Next, they try to drive over to the housing office a block away to retrieve the key to 1109. When they attempted to open the door, however, the key did not fit the lock. Now the officers had a decision to make. Do they break the door down or do they leave? They attempted to speak with the neighbors. Most didn't answer the door, and the ones that did claimed they didn't hear or see anything out of the ordinary. The janitor could not locate an alternate key to open McCoy's door. And at 9.48 p.m., the Chicago PD left the Abla housing projects. The next evening, a friend and neighbor of McCoy, Deborah Lasley, became worried when Ruthie failed to show up at her door in the morning and in the afternoon, something Ruth McCoy would do almost every day. She had also seen the police around apartment 1109 the night before. She called police, and they sent more officers to Abla to the apartment, this time accompanied by the housing project security guards. Once again, they attempted to knock with no response. It was at this point the officers suggested that maybe they should break the door down. The Chicago Housing Authority, however, afraid of a lawsuit, discouraged the CPD from breaking down the door. And so, for the second time, the officers left the Abla housing projects with no knowledge of Ruth McCoy's whereabouts. The next day, April 24th, Deborah Lasley was still concerned about the welfare of her friend. So rather than call police again, she went to the housing office, and that afternoon a housing official arrived at apartment 1109 with a carpenter who drilled through the lock in the door. What they found was nothing short of tragic. The apartment smelled of rotting flesh. They discovered Ruth McCoy dead in her bedroom, with four gunshot wounds, one to her left shoulder, one in her left thigh, her abdomen, and then another gunshot through her arm, passing through her liver and exiting her abdomen, more than likely the killing shot. The intruders had entered McCoy's apartment through the bathroom, and more specifically, the cabinet housing the bathroom vanity. This is what Ruth McCoy meant when she told 911 they were throwing the cabinet down, and when she stated, they want to come in through the bathroom. Break-ins through the cabinets in the bathrooms were not all that uncommon either in the Abla housing development. 
as residents would frequently barricade their bathroom doors at night in case anyone tried to get in via the cabinets. Various articles state how easy it was to move from one apartment to the other via the pipe chase, which was accessible through the bathroom cabinet. Tracing back the access points to the apartments that could have had access to McCoy's via this method, it was speculated that the killers came from apartment 1108. The actual resident of 1108 was not living there at the time, but it was a common practice for vacant apartments to be squatted in or used by drug dealers and other criminals. In time, two men were arrested for the murder of Ruthie McCoy, both residents of Abla, Edward Turner, who was 19 years of age, and John Hondras, who was 22 years of age. They were charged with murder, home invasion, armed robbery, and residential burglary. Despite the brutal nature of the murder, the scene did not give up too much actual physical evidence. By the time McCoy's body was found, the apartment had been scrubbed of fingerprints and the phone was missing. The phone, which police officers clearly heard ringing the first night they went to check up on Ruth. Her bathroom cabinet was also missing. Due to the time between the crime occurring and the door to Ruth's apartment finally being opened days later, the killers have had plenty of time to clean up the crime scene. In March of 1990, a few years later, the trial began. Due to the lack of physical evidence, the case was built mainly on eyewitness testimony. Both girlfriends of Edward Turner and John Hondras testified at the trial. Turner's girlfriend stating that on the night of April 22, 1987, Edward Turner showed up to her apartment bragging that he had shot someone. Hondra's girlfriend stated that on April 23rd at 3.30 a.m., both Hondras and Turner showed up at her apartment with a rocking chair and a television, asking if they could keep the items at her place. Turner testified that he was joking when he was bragging to his girlfriend about shooting someone. He also says that he was in apartment 1108 when he heard gunshots on the night of April 22nd, and he ran down to the lobby where he saw Hondras. He claims he saw someone else exiting apartment 1109 with a rocking chair and television, asking for help to move it. Turner says he then peeked inside apartment 1109 and saw a body, but did not have anything to do with the murder itself. At the end of the trial, both Turner and Hondras were found not guilty. And to this day, the brutal murder of Ruthie McCoy is officially unresolved. So why, besides the fact that this terrible crime went unpunished by the justice system, does this particular case leave a sour taste in the mouth of many who hear it? First could be the conditions it occurred under. A dangerous housing project. Drug addict riddled hallways, rampant crime, dark ominous stairwells, the threat of bodily harm or worse literally around every corner. And of course, the most terrifying part, the off chance that during the night, an intruder could enter through your bathroom and situate themselves inside your apartment, ready to do who knows what. This was a reality that those who were forced to use this public housing to survive faced every day. Some of these conditions were so creepy, in fact, that quite a few of these scenarios became the basis and inspiration for the movie Candyman, as mentioned earlier. Another heavily criticized aspect of this case is the response from law enforcement. Many wonder, why didn't they break down the door the first day? after getting reports of gunshots, after Ruth herself called 911, and after they received no response from knocking or calling? Why did they not enter the apartment the second day, after her friend expressed concerns as to her whereabouts? Why did they inadvertently give the perpetrators so much breathing room to cover their crime and clean up any physical evidence? Perhaps more decisive action from the Chicago PD couldn't have saved Ruth McCoy's life. But it would have preserved the crime scene, initiated the investigation right away, and prevented Ruth's body from not being found for two days 
after her murder. The way the Chicago PD treated Ruthie McCoy's case was both incompetent and totally inexcusable. However, this seeming ineptitude makes a little more sense when you begin to consider the circumstances around the Chicago PD's dealings with these dangerous housing projects. Police Captain Raymond Risley even admits that if the distress call had come from somewhere other than a housing project, the officers may have been more apt to forcibly enter. However, he states, a majority of the distress calls that come from the projects are likely to be hoaxes. The housing projects themselves are not a stranger to crime or even murder. One article stating, CHA residents are blown away, knifed, kicked to death almost every week, two or three times a week in warmer weather. McCoy was only one of three Abla residents murdered in the waning days of April. It even states later in the same article that finding a body in the Abla housing projects within two days of the crime is actually pretty efficient given the circumstances. Analyzing all of this makes Ruthie McCoy's murder part of a much larger issue. The issue of housing, safety, and how disadvantaged people are treated not just in death, but also in life. How some can live a life of relative ease, free of discomfort, and some wonder if they will even make it up to their apartment without being attacked or killed. Sandy Siegel, who works as a coordinator in a psychiatric center that mainly serves ABLA residents, stated, regarding housing projects like ABLA, people living in them become hopeless and helpless. They stop dreaming. They don't even have a concept of what it would be like to not be there. It's like the abused child. They're more comfortable. At least they know what to expect. feel helpless in the face of violence and crime and rape and assault. And that's a, a, a different kind of stress. It could be compared to, to being a war, in a war zone. Um, you live with constant fear. Thank you for watching. I hope you liked this video, and if you did, go ahead and hit like. If you want to see more videos like this, let me know in the comments below. A huge thanks to my patrons who support my channel through Patreon. Margbot, Robert W., Amber Pervez, Lauren Johnson, Nicholas Eppolito, Tommy Sharp, Karina, Heather Brown, Fizzle, Aaron Wilkins, James Harrington, and Mary Phillips. I appreciate all the support. Here's a sample of some patron-only content that's available right now, and I'll see you guys in the next video. ribs cracking beneath my hands, and the boy's screams turned to gargles as he was unable to gasp for another breath. He's not going under, the anesthesiologist yelled as he gave the kid a second dose of propofol. Of course, without a functioning heart, there'd be no way for the drug to flow through his veins, even as I tried my best to pump it for him. After an hour of compressions, the chief of surgery had intervened and ordered us to stop. At that point, we caused more damage than we helped. What's happening to me? The kid stuttered, still conscious. None of us responded. We couldn't find any words to describe the horrific sight before us. Most of the staff had left due to the sight. We'd faced many challenges in our career, but nothing quite like this. What's your name? I asked, despite already having seen it in the file. I just wanted him to focus. Brian Dawson, he responded. I took a deep breath, doing my best to keep my composure. You were in an accident, Brian.